Hi, my name is Todd Graves, co-founder of Graves Golf and author of this book, The Single Plane Golf Swing, Play Better Golf the Mo Norman Way. I wanted to do a book review of the book that we wrote with Tim O'Connor because this book is very instructional and there's a lot of really interesting information about the single plane swing and a lot of you start learning the single plane swing from this book or one of my uh, single plane videos. So I thought it would be great to do a review on the book and kind of go chapter by chapter and kind of talk to you about my journey and the single plane swing and some elements of the single plane swing that you can find in the book that'll help you learn what I learned was an easier way to play golf. Now, today I want to discuss basically the first four chapters. You know, it's my experience of the single plane swing and how this whole thing evolved and really how this book uh, was actually written and created came from my experience from trying to become a better golfer, probably exactly like you. So let me kind of just walk you through my experience as uh, a player. I, I, I'll just go back to when, way before this book was ever written, when I too was trying to figure out an easier way to play golf. Now, I played college golf. I was a decent high school golfer. Uh, I won a number of tournaments in high school, like a lot of guy, kids that played golf. I wanted to become a better player and aspired to be a college player. Got, got into the University of Oklahoma as a walk-on and played with some really, really great players at the university. I wasn't a fantastic golfer in college. I was an okay golfer, but one of the greatest things about being a college golfer was that I got to play with a lot of great players. And I was good enough to actually play on the Asian tour in 1991. I traveled to Southeast Asia and played with some of the best players out there, like Todd Hamilton and David Toms and some of these guys, VJ Singh. These guys were great players. And I got to really, really grow my game as a golfer playing on the Asian Tour in 1991. But when I got back from Asia in 1991, I thought, you know, I was good friends with some of the players out there. I said, you know, how do you get better? How do, how do you get better as a player? You know, who, what, what, what do good players do? And they usually hire a coach, a swing coach, and they start developing their golf swing from working with a famous coach. So I moved to Dallas, Texas, and started working with Hank Haney on my golf game. Now, I gotta tell you about working with a guy at that caliber of an instructionist, Hank Haney. Hank taught me more than any other teacher about the golf swing, about swing playing, and what was necessary to become a great golfer. Now, I developed a real understanding of the golf swing, but, but I had a problem, is that it was very, very difficult. And every day that I would work on my game, I just couldn't, I couldn't figure out. I spent three years in Dallas, Texas, working on my golf game. I had sponsors and I was a player. And I was just struggling to become better. After three years of working on my swing with some of the best coaches in the world, I was getting worse as a player. Now, that was my experience from instruction. And that's why I'm here talking to you about rethinking this. because. That's when I started rethinking my own golf game was because how can you work three years on your golf swing? I was hitting a thousand golf balls a day, working on the conventional golf swing, making lots of changes, studying the swing, working on the video, and I was getting worse. And so that left me in a, in a state of frustration. I don't know if any of you out there get frustrated, but I was very frustrated that I could work that hard on my golf game and still not have any answers to how, how to swing the golf club better. Well, that's when I started rethinking my own golf swing. I was introduced, I was lucky, because a friend of mine named Matthew Lane, he was a very good player that I played college golf with. He came, he was playing the Canadian Tour, and he, he came up and he handed me a videotape. And the videotape was of a guy named Mo Norman. And I didn't, I had heard of Mo Norman, but I never really you know, thought much about him. I didn't know if he was even a real, but I heard, heard that he was one of the greatest ball strikers, like a Ben Hogan type guy that was one of the greatest ball strikers that ever played the game. So he showed me, and Matthew, when he handed me the tape, he said, this guy is so good, he's a freak. That's how good he is. And so I watched the tape. Now, here's what I noticed. When, when I worked with Hank Haney on my golf swing, 
what would happen was we would draw a line on the television screen. So we would draw a line on the screen. Now back this is back in the day when we didn't have the apps where you can, you know, all the mobile apps. We actually had to go to a TV screen and we had to draw a line on the screen with a, a dry erase marker. So we'd draw, we'd we'd set up an address and we'd draw a line on the TV screen. And then we would swing and we'd we'd try to impact on the same line. And every single time that I would impact, it was higher than the line. So in other words, I was starting on one plane and impacting on another. And I saw this. And then I started studying other players. And I noticed that other players did the same thing, like Seve Ballesteros, who I admired quite greatly. He had, he had a, I thought he was an amazing golfer. I loved the way he played the game of golf. He would start hands very low on one plane and then impact on a much higher plane. I'd draw the line on the screen. I'd be on a much higher plane. And I started to notice that no one impacted from address to impact. Now, What's the, mo what's the most important part of a golf swing is impact, right? Can you simplify getting to impact? And I noticed that no one could simplify. They'd start low and impact high. And I kept drawing these lines on the screen. And here's the thing about it. If I tried to get my hands lower where they started in the conventional golf swing, I got worse. So the more I tried to achieve what they wanted me to achieve, the worse I got. So when M Matthew handed me this videotape, the first thing I did with Mo, obviously, was I drew a line on the screen. And when I, when, when Mo, when I drew the line, Mo started and impacted exactly on the same plane. That was when I started rethinking, there is an easier way to play the game of golf. You can start and impact on the same plane. You just can't start the hands low to do it. You have to start the hands higher. And that's where this, in, my entire story started right there was discovering that there is an easier way to play the game of golf and Mo Norman was the exact model that I needed to, to start practicing. So I took that videotape and for the next year practiced Mo's swing. I basically just mimicked what I saw in that video. I stood like Mo, held my hands like Mo, raised my hands up into the air like Mo and I immediately started improving. So that's where the single plane swing for me I started rethinking and rediscovering an easier way to play golf and from, from the rest is history. I became a better golfer. I qualified for the Canadian Tour in 1995. I played tour events until 2000 and I started the Graves Golf Academy in 2001 to teach the single plane swing. Now, one of the things that you'll discover in this book, starting in the first few chapters, is I go through a little bit of my journey. You know, it's, I'm embarking on the journey to the single plane and a little bit is the story I just told you there. But a lot of it is about Mo Norman and how he figured out and discovered his golf swing. And one of the most important things that you'll find about Mo is that is this, this, the way he addressed the golf ball from start to impact. What's important to me, if, if I'm gonna help you become a better golfer and, and simplify this process so you don't have to go through all the processes I went through, is that you have a model. And one of the things that I represent in this book is that you're using Mo as the model for your golf swing, starting at address. So I go through Mo's swing here, and you can go through it frame by frame, and you can see that I go through Mo's swing and kind of demonstrate all the positions of, positions of the swing. Starting, basically, if you look at his address position, going to his back swing, and then back to impact, where he actually impacts on the same plane that he addressed. So you get to represent and see his swing here and what it looks like. And that's really the first, you know, that's the first thing you notice about Mo is his swing looks so different than other golf swings that you see. So that's what I talk about here in the first couple of chapters. Now, you know, when I met Mo, so that I, I discussed my meeting with Mo, I met him in a clinic in Chicago in 1994. And this was a year after I saw him on video for the first time, but I had been practicing his swing. So I watched him do a demonstration. Now, I have a hard time describing this demonstration. And those of you who have seen Mo hit golf balls understand that watching Mo do a clinic and a demonstration is something that's hard to describe because the, the flight of the golf ball was, was perfectly straight. Uh, he hit it in the same window, same trajectory every time he hit the ball. There was just so much. And so here's how I, here's how I kind of normally tell what happened in this clinic. You know, Mo steps out there, and if you ever watched Mo do a clinic, he would basically, his golf clubs would be scattered everywhere, kind of laying on his bag. And then 
he started hitting some wedge shots. He always started out with the short iron. He talked about how the wedge, wedge play is a very important part of the game. And then he hit the first shot from 50 yards and it hit the target. Then he hit another shot from, from the, at the same target, hit it again. The third shot hit it again, and the fourth shot kind of skipped right underneath the target. So the first three shots actually hit the target from about 50 yards. It's kind of impressive. Well, then as the day progressed, you know, we were on a driving range. It was, it was dirty. It was dusty. The ground was very hard. It wasn't the ideal conditions. It wasn't like the perfect driving range. It wasn't the greatest conditions. And Mo started firing drivers off of the ground. And then he's hitting drivers. From a, there's a 250-yard pull at the end of the range, and Mo was hitting drivers, and about e he, about every fourth or fifth shot, you'd hear a ding off the pole because there was about a three-inch pole with 250 on the top of the pole, and Mo would hit the target. So he's hitting drivers, and the, and the flight was was perfectly straight, and it was just incredible to watch Mo hit golf balls. Now I'd played on the Asian Tour, I'd played all around the world with great players, and yeah, I played with some really good ball strikers and players, but nobody could actually hit a golf ball as consistently and accurately as what I saw that day in that clinic with Mo. So I was incredibly impressed with the way he, the simplicity of his ability to consistently hit a golf ball straight. So I walked up to him at the end of the clinic and I said, Mo, you're the, you're the best I've ever seen. He goes, I know I'm the best in the world. And I said, how'd you learn to do that? And he goes, hard work, you can't buy it. And that was when I said, you know, it, it's copying his swing and modeling him he already did all the hard work. All I have to do is keep copying what he was doing. And I had been doing that for a year. So I asked him, I said, do you mind if I hit a few shots with your clubs? I grabbed his eight iron and he let me hit his clubs a few times. And he said, look, you look like me. You look like me without a belly. So I became friends with Mo Norman that day. And for the next 10 years, I spent modeling Mo, studying him, learning from him, playing golf with him to understand his golf swing and him and help, help be myself become a better golfer, but in the same process become friends with one of the greatest ball strikers and human beings I've ever met. So that was kind of my journey to meeting Mo. So I go through that in the book, and in the first part of the book, I discuss what are the differences between the conventional swing and the single plane swing, and a lot of that is right at the address position, if you look at address. Now, if you want to find out more information about Mo, so I, I dedicated some of this book here to Tim O'Connor's book, The Feeling of Greatness. We rewrote The Feeling of Greatness, which is Tim's biography of Mo Norman. That's a fantastic book that, that you, can, you can pick up and purchase and read while you have some time. It's also on Audible. You can just listen to the audio book. I had it recorded as well. So if you want to find out more about Mo and the character and his life, you can pick up that, a copy of his book as well. So that's kind of a little section of this book is dedicated to that, The Feeling of Greatness. Now, here's the thing about Mo's address position, and this is where you've got to start, because remember earlier when I talked about addressing and impacting on a single plane? Well, if this is the, the purpose of this book. When I wrote this book, it was to simplify the process, but we have to define what does simple really mean? What is the definition of simple? Simple, if you're going to talk about simplifying a golf swing, You've got to make it easier to go from address to impact. And what does that mean? That means you've got to reduce the amount of motion from the start of your swing all the way to impact. Less rotation, less movement, less body movement, less stress on the body. That's exactly what Mo Norman did from address to impact. So what I want to walk you through, and you'll see it here in the first couple chapters. I think this is chapter, let's go back here. This is chapter three. I go through how simplicity is defined at the very start of the golf swing at address. So we talk about the address position, and there's two angles I like to look at the golf swing. One is the face-on angle, which you see, Mo at face-on. Notice how he sets the club behind the ball. We'll discuss that. And then you have the down-the-line angle, where you see the single plane alignment. But it's very important. There's some things in this tilt and the body positions. And today, I'm going to discuss with you how we can work on the ideal single plane address and you can nail down those elements because Mo's golf swing starts at the address position. Further on in the chapter, I go through his backswing positions. And the reason I broke it down into these positions, position two, three, four, five, and then, and then six, I go through kind of frame by frame. The reason I broke it down to look like this is because, you know what? You can take a video camera out and you can study your swing and then compare it to Mo's swing. 
right? So that's, that's an important thing. That's exactly what I did to model his swing. I wanted to have the same position in the backswing, the same impact position, same lower body positions. And you know what? The more I practiced it, the easier it became. So I go through impact, his release, finish, and I go through his entire swing. Now, what I want to do today is I want to stand up and I want to go through just the basic principle of the address position and cover what I look for in a perfect single plane swing. This is my discovery of how to simplify your golf swing starting at the very address position. So let's go take a look and we'll, do, we'll go ahead and talk you through the single plane address. So rethinking your address position starts when you look at the conventional golf address position. Now this is where I was because this is what all the conventional instructors were teaching me at address was the idea of hanging the arms below the shoulders. But there's more to it than that because when you hang the arms below the shoulders, the body position is in such a way that you have to make up for it when you get to impact. And that was what I was discovering when I looked at video of players. When I would draw the line on the TV screen, so I would, I would see them at address and draw the line, uh, and on myself at address, you'd see me at address, I would draw the line on the screen, so I'd draw the line on the club shaft. And this is my arms hanging straight down. And so what, what you get is, you know, this is where conventional golf sets you up. They think that this athletic position here is the ideal way to set up to a golf ball. However, by the time you swing and you get to impact, the shaft ends up lifting onto a higher plane. So you're starting low and the body gets into a tilted, lifted position at impact. This is what I was noticing. This is prior to meeting Mo. I was noticing that address was on a different plane than impact. Now, the more that I did this, the more that I, that I started trying to get my hands to return to that impact plane, the more I stepped lowering my hands, the worse I got. This is where I got frustrated because this low hand starting position made it very difficult to be consistently getting to the moment of impact. This is where the whole idea of simplicity comes in. How can you simplify the golf swing? Well, you got to start and impact in a similar same plane. This is exactly where I saw Mo. So I see this video, I get handed a videotape of Mo Norman, and here he is. Instead of being hands low position, I see Mo, and he's reaching for the golf ball. And of course, I draw a line on that club shaft. And then when he swings, he returns the club exactly on that same line. He started an impact on the same exact plane. I immediately knew when I saw that, that that's what I had been trying to do. I just couldn't do it. You just simply can't do it from this position here. Now, why can't you do it from that hand position? Here's what happens. This is where I can get into a little of the science behind the differences here, which I've dug into the science. I didn't put a ton of science in the book because this is kind of the stuff where you go too far. And in my golf schools, I talk about it. It's the TMI, too much information. But I think it's important that we understand a little bit of the elements that you're going to deal with. If you decide you're a conventional golfer, let me tell you what's actually happening scientifically. When you put yourself in that two plane position, what you're really doing, watch what happens to my body when I go into a straight down position. All right? Notice that I'm not very tilted, but my, my hands are hanging straight down. This trail hand, this body gets put into this rotation where this is a dress and that's impact. So in other words, the club goes back on one plane, you have to retilt your body and then bring this hand back down. You actually have a 13 degree rotation of this hand from address to impact, plus the body's increasing its tilt. So you have to accommodate, not only do you have a spatial problem, because we'll talk about that in a second, but you have a rotational problem. You're creating a rotation like this. You have to go back this way and then tilt and come back in this way. So there's this rotational element occurring because of the conventional setup. The other problem you have is that this rotation and the way you're set up here at address, you have a spatial problem because notice that you're pretty close to the golf ball because when your arms are hanging straight down, you're too close to the golf ball. And then by the time the club gets swung, you have to make room, lift the body up, and somehow the hands get lifted into impact. Look at all the stuff that's going on from 
what I call the one mistake, which is this conventional address causing you to have to lift the body up to get the impact and rotate and tilt it. And there's another thing that's going on. Notice how when I, when I move, make that movement, I'm going up, but my upper body is going down. So you have this thing called compression. So now you're putting stress on the lower back. Now, I didn't know any of this stuff. I was just taking instruction from the conventional golf world, but here was the problem. If you look at the players on the tour, all of them that are setting up in this conventional setup in the two plane, they're making these, they're, they're making up compensations for this differently. For example, Justin Thomas's feet are off the ground. So they're all doing things in their golf swings to accommodate the two plane starting position. So here's the question. This is where we're rethinking this whole thing, right? That's what this whole series is about. I want you to rethink this. I want to simplify all that. I want to throw that out. I want you to throw every golf magazine you have away. I want you to throw all those other golf books away except for a single plane golf swing book. And I want you to rethink the way you set up to a golf ball because this is the game changer. And let me just help you right now do some very simple things. And in the next part of the series, we're going to cover this in more detail. Let's do two things. Remember, the address position is not just changing the grip. It's not just getting your hands higher. You have to get everything, the tilt of the body and the hands positioned correctly. We have to accommodate all those things to get it right. So I'm gonna do it from those two angles, face on view and down the line. I'm gonna quickly show you here some things I want you to do to get this address, simplify the address and get it right. First thing I want you to do, well, let's do it this way first. I want you to tilt your body correctly, but we're gonna do this in a specific way. I'm gonna put your hand straight out like this, right? So I'm gonna have your arm straight out I want you to do this. I want you to tilt your body. See that? So tilt your body. And then I want you to go down to the ground. Now, one way you can do that, if you tilt your body, I want you to put your arm out and I want you to, I don't care how you put your arm out right now, I just want you to hold your bicep like this and I want you to twist your forearm just like that. So you're basically putting the forearm, I'm isolating the shoulder and rotating the forearm into a full range and there's your arm position in your tilt. See that? Now notice how the arm and club are aligned. So you got this alignment of the arm and club. That's because of the tilt of the body. Do that. Now I'm going to take this hand. Notice where it went because I'm tilted. See this hand went lower. I'm going to bring this hand up. And notice the hand when I bring it up. See how it's in a rotation? It's in a underhanded rotation. See that? If I didn't do that, it's on a top rotation. That's conventional golf. The tilt, see how the tilt brings the hand under? So I overlap and I bring this hand from underneath. Now you can see my address. I have this nice alignment of the lead arm and the club and I have this hand in the proper rotation because what I've done there is I've put this hand in a non-rotational position. I'm going to be able to hit a golf ball now and there's going to be no rotation of the trail hand. All right, that's one of the secrets. We're going to cover that in the next section. Now, what you're seeing from this angle is the lead arm alignment, the tilt, and now look what happens the club is lining up with the trail arm. See that? So now I have the club lining up with the trail arm. Notice here, the lead arm is higher than the trail arm. See that? So this arm is visible above this arm because this arm is in that rotation. Now, some of you out there who have been playing around with a single plane swing, I'm not gripping it in the palm of the hand. I have this aligned. This is in the fingers of the hand. I'm holding it into that heel pad. All right, so that's in the fingers. Notice if I choke down, there's plenty of space there, so I'm not holding it too high into the hand. It's the back of the hand is lining up with the club face. This hand, because of the tilt, this hand, the rotation is what lines it up through the palm, but I'm not sitting the club in the palm. So it's that alignment that matters. It's getting the club lined up. So when I set up now, notice my legs are straight, my lead arm is visible above the trail arm, and now I am in a perfect alignment on the impact plane, and then I got a perfect alignment with the lead arm and the club. Those are some very key elements. What I want you to do before we get to the next section is play around with body tilt and then arm position and see if you can't get that extended position and master that address position from the single plane there. Make sure your legs are straight. Make sure you have that alignment and that alignment. We're going to cover more of this in the next section. As you can see, we're going to help you rethink 
your golf swing. We're gonna take you from a conventional complicated golf swing to a simple single plane swing. If you're enjoying this content, by the way, and don't, don't forget to hit the subscribe button below and there's a little bell icon there. Make sure you click on that because that's gonna give you notifications of any new content that we produce. In the next series, we're gonna cover some of the discoveries I made in Mo Norman's single plane swing and cover chapters five, six, and seven of the single plane golf swing, Play Better Golf the Mo Norman way.